This video provides an overview of five types of bariatric surgery. I look at the sleeve gastrectomy, the Ruin Y gastric bypass, the one anastomosis gastric bypass, the duodenal switch, and the single anastomosis duodenal ileal bypass with sleeve gastrectomy. All of these fall under minimally invasive surgery since they can either be laparoscopic or robotic. I spend the most time on the sleeve gastrectomy and Ruin Y gastric bypass because they're the two most common types of bariatric surgery in the United States. According to the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, the sleeve gastrectomy has been the most common type of bariatric surgery performed in the United States since 2013, when it surpassed the Ruin Y gastric bypass. At that time, these two procedures accounted for 42.1% and 34.2% of all bariatric surgery cases respectively. Since then, the difference has increased significantly. In 2020, the sleeve gastrectomy accounted for 61.4% of cases, whereas the Ruin Y accounted for only 20.8% of cases. The sleeve gastrectomy involves a resection of more than 75% of the greater curvature of the stomach to create a narrow tubular structure for food and beverages to pass through. The remaining stomach has an initial capacity of around 100 milliliters. The surgeon removes the resected portion from the body and no other parts of the gastrointestinal tract are changed. Simplicity is one reason it's become so popular. It's easy for clinicians to explain to patients, easy for patients to understand, and is a relatively quick and simple procedure for a surgeon to perform. That's especially true when you compare it to the Ruin Y gastric bypass, which involves rearranging the gastrointestinal tract. With the Ruin Y, the surgeon reduces the stomach to a small gastric pouch with an initial capacity of approximately 15 to 30 milliliters. Then they dissect the small intestine at the jejunum just beyond the ligament of traits. The distal end gets pulled up and attached to the gastric pouch to create a gastrojejunostomy, and the proximal end is attached to the jejunum to create a jejunojejunostomy. When completed, the two limbs create a Y shape that gives the procedure its name. Food and beverages arrive in the gastric pouch and pass through the gastrojejunostomy into the Ru limb, bypassing the excluded stomach and duodenum. When they reach the jejunojejunostomy, they're met by secretions from the excluded stomach, the small intestine, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, which pass through the biliopancreatic limb. Those secretions assist with digestion and absorption as nutrients continue through the remainder of the small intestine. As you can see, the Ruin Y is more challenging for clinicians to explain, more difficult for patients to understand, and a more complex procedure for a surgeon to perform. Data comparing the effectiveness of these procedures is represented best by two randomized control trials called Sleeve Pass and SM Boss. These studies examined 465 patients who underwent a sleeve gastrectomy or a Ruin Y gastric bypass. The average age and body mass index was in the 40s, and most patients were female. Patients who underwent the Ruin Y lost a greater percentage of their body weight after 1 year, 3 years, and 5 years of follow up. At 5 years, those in the Ruin Y group had an average weight loss of 27.2% of their actual body weight. Those in the sleeve gastrectomy group had an average weight loss of 23.7% of their actual body weight. The average difference in total weight loss was 4.4 kilograms, or approximately 10 pounds. Sleeve Pass and SM Boss also looked at the risk of complications between the two procedures and found no significant difference in mortality, reoperation, or reintervention after 5 years. Thus, these two randomized control trials suggest the Ruin Y gastric bypass offers a slight advantage for weight loss, with no significant increase in the risk of complications for up to 5 years. Nevertheless, when larger sample sizes are studied, they show the Ruin Y gastric bypass is associated with a higher risk of complications. 
For example, Howard et al. performed a retrospective cohort study of roughly 38,000 patients who underwent a ruined Y gastric bypass and 57,000 patients who underwent a sleeve gastrectomy. They found that patients who underwent a sleeve gastrectomy were 27% less likely to experience complications after the procedure. Those patients were also 23% less likely to require reintervention after 5 years. Still, the patients who underwent a sleeve gastrectomy were over 3 times more likely to require a revision surgery after 5 years. The study doesn't detail the reason for the revisions, but typically a revision with the sleeve gastrectomy involves the conversion to a ruin Y gastric bypass. A revision is often necessary when patients with a sleeve gastrectomy experience persistent gastroesophageal reflux or when they don't achieve or maintain their weight loss goal. In summary, the sleeve gastrectomy offers comparable weight loss to the ruin Y gastric bypass at 5 years and has a slightly lower risk of complications. It's also easier for clinicians to explain and for patients to understand, which I suspect has contributed to its popularity. One of the primary issues with the sleeve gastrectomy is that the narrow tubular stomach can worsen pre-existing gastroesophageal reflux disease or result in new gastroesophageal reflux disease. The Ruin Y is much better at managing and preventing this condition. Therefore, surgeons push patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease toward the ruin Y, and patients who experience gastroesophageal reflux after the sleeve gastrectomy may have their sleeve converted to a ruin Y through revision surgery. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you hit the like button, share it with a friend, and shop for more free and exclusive content by clicking the link down in the video description. Now that we've looked at the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin Y gastric bypass, we're moving on to the three other types of bariatric surgery. The one anastomosis gastric bypass, the duodenal switch, and the single anastomosis duodenal ileal bypass with sleeve gastrectomy. Compared to the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin Y gastric bypass, these procedures make up a much smaller percentage of bariatric surgeries performed in the United States. In 2020, the duodenal switch made up 1.8% of cases, which was higher than it had been since 2011. Meanwhile, the one anastomosis gastric bypass and the single anastomosis duodenal ileal bypass with sleeve gastrectomy made up only 0.7% and 0.2% of cases respectively, with 2020 being the first time the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery reported their prevalence. Despite accounting for a small number of cases, I wanted to cover these procedures because their popularity is rising. First up is the one anastomosis gastric bypass, which is similar to the ruin Y gastric bypass. But there are two key differences. First, the one anastomosis gastric bypass has a longer, narrower gastric pouch. Second, and quite obviously with the procedure's name, there's one anastomosis instead of two. A loop of small intestine is brought up to the gastric pouch and attached to create a gastrojejunostomy distal to the ligament of traits. With this arrangement, there's no need to reattach a biliopancreatic limb because the flow of secretions continues uninterrupted, passing through the site of the anastomosis. A recent systematic review by Balamarugan et al. compared weight loss between the one anastomosis gastric bypass and ruin Y gastric bypass. They found that, after 5 years, the one anastomosis gastric bypass offered a slight advantage for weight loss. However, a major limitation of the one anastomosis gastric bypass is that the design doesn't offer the same advantage for managing and preventing reflux. So, the ruin Y holds an edge for patients with a history of reflux or those who develop it postoperatively. Next up, we have the duodenal switch. This procedure combines aspects of both the sleeve gastrectomy and the ruin Y, except that the two anastomoses are formed distal to the stomach. 
It begins with creating a sleeve gastrectomy with an initial capacity of approximately 150 to 250 milliliters. Then it involves the dissection of the duodenum and ileum to create a duodeno-ileostomy, preserving the pyloric sphincter and bypassing the entire jejunum. Finally, the surgeon creates an ileo-ileostomy to establish the bilio-pancreatic limb. The two limbs converge close to the ileocecal valve with a small amount of space to complete digestion and absorption. Out of all of the bariatric surgeries covered thus far, the duodenal switch induces the greatest amount of weight loss. Nonetheless, with the need to create two anastomoses in the small intestine, it's arguably the most complex procedure, and it raises the highest level of concern for malnutrition through malabsorption. That's two of the reasons many bariatric surgery clinics have avoided it for so long. Last but not least, we have the single anastomosis duodenal ileal bypass with sleeve gastrectomy, which most people just call the Sadie S. The Sadie S was proposed in 2007 as an alternative to the duodenal switch and has recently increased in popularity. Put simply, it is to the duodenal switch what the one anastomosis gastric bypass is to the ruin Y. Rather than creating two anastomoses, the surgeon creates one by dissecting the duodenum and pulling up a loop of the ileum to create a duodeno ileostomy, preserving the pyloric sphincter and bypassing the jejunum. Then the secretions from the biliopancreatic limb continue uninterrupted, passing through the site of the anastomosis. A proposed advantage of pursuing the Sadie S over the duodenal switch is that a single anastomosis reduces the complexity of the procedure. The distance from the anastomosis to the ileocecal valve is also greater than with the duodenal switch, so it should pose less of a threat to induce malnutrition through malabsorption. The Sadie S was just endorsed as an appropriate bariatric surgery by the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery in 2020. Their evidence-based position statement says that it provides similar outcomes to the duodenal switch. It also states there remains concerns about intestinal adaptation, nutritional issues, optimal limb lengths, and long-term weight loss slash regain after this procedure. Thus, they recommend a cautious approach to the adoption of it. If you're a dietitian working in a clinical setting, you may encounter any one of these procedures or receive questions about them. At the very least, you should be able to explain what they are and some of the basic advantages and disadvantages of each one. You should also know how they work to promote weight loss, which I cover in the next video in this series. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel.